Praise you, Lord, I praise you. Oh, I praise you. Yes, I praise you. How I praise you, my precious Lord. I love you, Lord, I love you. Oh, I love you. Yes, I love you, Lord, I love you, my lovely Lord. You are worthy, Lord, you're worthy. So you worthy, so worthy. Oh, you worthy, most holy Lord. Amen. Named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters Martha and Mary. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. We see a circumstance here. We see a person named Lazarus who was sick. There's a problem going on here. Somebody is sick. Let's go to verse 3. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now if we see something else going on here. One is there is sickness in the body of a man. Second thing what we're seeing is this man is not any ordinary man. He is called the friend of Jesus. Information is going to Jesus Christ saying that, Lord, your friend Lazarus is sick. We see two things here. One is sickness, and two is who is sick. You have a lot of sick people all over the world. But when somebody is sick, the heart of compassion is moved towards them. But when that sick person is a friend of God, it's even greater. Now, it must draw the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Let's read verse 4. Let's see what Jesus did. How did he react to this? Verse 4. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Verse 5. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Let me tell you this. Jesus Christ stayed where he was for two more days, not because he didn't care, because he knew the outcome. In your life, in my life, when the king of glory knows the outcome, what is going to happen? Because who is involved now? Jesus is involved now. If Jesus would have not been involved in this, then Lazarus would have been dead, right? The outcome is different here because... The king of glory, the Lord of life, has been involved in Lazarus' life. Now they have called Jesus Christ and they said, Lord, your friend is sick. They have informed the condition of Lazarus to Jesus Christ. A question for you today. Whatever problem you're going through, whether it's sickness, whether it's financial difficulty, whether it's a problem in the family, or it is an internal turmoil that is going on within yourself. Did you inform your situation to the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you tell the Lord, Lord, something is seriously wrong here. I need help. Even more than calling a 911 service, calling on Jesus Christ will get you a faster result. Jesus Christ is so powerful. Jesus Christ is so powerful. There's something going on here. Somebody will look at this and say, oh my goodness, what in the world is happening here? Even if you call 911, sometimes they may not come right away. They may take their sweet time sometimes. But I don't think they would take two days to come. Jesus Christ delayed for two days. You know why? He knew the outcome. In your life and in my life, if you and I, May a petition to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he knows the end from the beginning. Remember, he knows your outcome. As long as my petition has reached him, I can be calm. I can sit back and say, I've given it to the Lord. How many of you have had the experience, like you need to get a mail somewhere, but they'll say it must be postmarked by a certain date, right? 
postmarked by a certain date. So you go to the mail, right? Post office, make sure it's postmarked, make sure you know whatever you need to get done. There you have the proof that it's postmarked. Once you mail it out, how many of you will sit and worry saying that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. No. It's gone. Once it's gone out of your hands, it is gone. You are so relieved that you mailed it out, right? Same way. Once you bring your petition to the Lord Jesus Christ and it is out of your mouth, remember he heard it. Our God is not deaf. Our God is not blind. Our God has no mental problems. Our God is all powerful. He has sharp hearing, sharper than a bat's hearing, sharper than any hearing, any stoner. His, his hearing is so powerful. He can even hear our inward sigh. He can even hear our inward thoughts. Our thoughts, until we verbalize it, no human can hear it. God can hear our thoughts. All our turmoil, all our anxieties, all our worries, all our burdens, Jesus Christ hears. So we need to understand this. Once we come to terms with who God is, then we can be at peace. I lay my burdens at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. My mail is out, right? And Jesus doesn't have a date on it. He doesn't say, okay, postmark it by, you know, September 17th or September 18th. After that, one month I take a break. And after that, I'll come and hear your prayers. No. Anytime we can call on Jesus. Call on the Lord and he will answer you. Call on the Lord and he will answer you. Call on the Lord and he will answer you. Just like we sang, when I call on Jesus, all things are possible. Whatever looks impossible in your life and in my life, Jesus says, yes, it will become possible. It may take two days. But you know what? When it takes two days, the result is going to be a grand result. How many of you know that if you go to a fast food restaurant, drive through you can get drive through burgers and drive through fries and whatever drive through But if you go to a restaurant, you want to have a good meal. You place the order and you wait. Right? You get something better than a drive through How many of you agree that when you order and you wait, you get something much better than a drive through Same thing at home. If you want to make a big meal, you are going to get something much better, but you have to wait. Right? Thanksgiving dinner. How many of you can think I can cook that in five minutes? Just pop it in the you know, microwave, pop it here, pop it there. And what will you get? All popped up things. It's not going to be as good as when you take time, right? About everything, when you put a lot of love on top of it and cook, it becomes even much better. Jesus Christ, when he answers your prayer, he has a lot of love in it. He just doesn't do like an ATM machine. You just, you know, punch in your numbers and you just, you know, put your card and here you go, $20 or $40, whatever you ask, just pops out. No. Our God has emotions. We have emotions because he has emotions. He's a God full of emotions. He's a God full of emotions. When we come to him and a drop of tear comes from our eyes, remember that, it touches his heart. It breaks his heart. And so when we have the Lord Jesus Christ, when we bring our petition to our Father in heaven, and he hears it, and he says, okay, I'm going to stay here for two more days. Remember that. That means something good is coming. Remember this example. Oh, I'm not getting a drive through meal. I'm getting something far, far better. We need, to be, we need to learn to be patient when it comes to receiving from the Lord. We can be very hasty many times. Because we want everything now, right now. If I don't get it right now, what do I do? I tantrum. We have to stop that. We have to say, you know what? I need to mature a little more. I walk by faith and not by sight. If I don't see it now, fine, because I know I placed my order. I know that I have sent my mail out. It's gone. That means I am getting my rebate back. I'm getting my response back, whatever it is. Whatever you sent the mail for, postmarked it. You're getting your response back. Remember that. Much more than 
a mailman. Our God is very prompt in receiving and replying. Like I said, he has a lot of love when he sends us the reply. He has a lot of love when he receives our petition. And let's see what happens after two more days. Jesus staying there. Let's see what happens over here. So let's go to verse 7. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? The disciples' wavelength is very different from Jesus Christ. He's saying something, and these guys are saying totally a different thing. And Jesus is so good and kind, he even replies to those questions. Verse 9, Jesus replied, There are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. Jesus Christ knew what he was talking about. Jesus Christ knew what he was talking about. I want to stop here for a minute and really drive this into your hearts and into your spirit. Anything God says is very important for us. If Jesus says that this is not unto death, if Jesus says this person is sleeping, our job is to believe what Jesus said. You know why? Because Jesus sees the end from the beginning. Because Jesus sees our hearts through and through. Because Jesus knows every cell that is operating in our bodies. Jesus knows everything. We have to come to terms with that. We have to come to terms with he knows everything. I don't know everything. I may know a little bit. I may know a little more. I might get some information by reading things online, but all the information is just information. But the King of kings and the Lord of lords has power over our circumstances. Our information can stay as information and not be able to do much. But he can overturn our circumstances. He can bring joy into our hearts. He can bring peace into our souls. He can overturn our financial difficulty. He can do things that are impossible. He can make it possible. So, Jesus Christ is saying over here, I'm going to go and wake Lazarus up. But the disciples didn't get it. Just like us, many times we don't get it. God has to come and tell us even more. He has to explain it to us even more. Verse 12. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will soon get better. They say, Lord, if he's sleeping, why do you have to go and wake him up? Now, if we just stop and look at that sentence and think, we need to tell the disciple, hey, think before you talk. If Jesus says he's sleeping, I have to go and wake him up. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. He is God. They've seen so many miracles. If he says that he's sleeping, I have to go wake him up, then... There's something to what he's saying because Jesus already knows if he's sleeping, if he's sick, he's going to wake up by himself. There's something else. But like we do many times, the disciples, they talked immediately, right? Even before they can process even what they're thinking. They jumped and they said, Lord, he can get up by himself. In essence, it's like, Lord, don't you know he can get up by himself? You have to go and wake him up. Why do we have to go all the way to wake him up? Look at the reply. Verse 13, they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. Two different wavelengths. Verse 14, so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. That is the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not like a cruel boss or a dictator who will say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to tell me something? Shut up and sit down. That's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ goes a step further, the Lord of love. He explained to them, he said, Lazarus is simply dead. That's it. Lazarus is dead. Jesus was not there to see. Nobody brought news for him. He sees the end from the beginning. He is God. He saw what happened to Lazarus there. Even before he died, he knew after two days, Lazarus is going to die, and he's going to go and wake him up in your situation, in your life circumstance. 
Many times you and I may bring something to God as if it's new. Lord, look at this. All of a sudden this happened. It's good to take it to God because God wants to hear from us. But know that even before you can tell God, he already knew what had already happened. When you know the power of the Almighty God, it'll be easier for you to receive your miracle. When you know who God is, when you know the power of his word, when you know the power that is present in God, it'll be easier for you to draw from that power. It is easier for you to see the miracle working hand of the Lord move in your life. Now, let's go to verse 15. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. You see a bit of sadness in Jesus' heart over here in verse 15. He's saying, you guys, no matter how many times you see, you don't believe. For your sakes, I'm glad that I wasn't there when he was sick. Because what would have happened? He would have healed him, right? So he's saying, come with me. So that you'll believe. I'm giving you another opportunity for you to believe. In your life, in my life, God would have done many things before. But now a new problem comes. What do we do? We act like this is the first time we are facing the problem. Forgetting all the things God has done for us in the past. May the Spirit of the Lord draw your attention to the Most High God. Every new problem we face is no longer new. It may look like new to us. It's no longer new to God. It shouldn't be new to you and I. If we turn back and see what God has done for you and for me, we need to just say that, oh, this is another thing, easy thing for my Jesus Christ. Let me take it to God and give it to him. Because nothing is difficult for the Almighty God. Let's go to verse 16. After Jesus so patiently explaining, there's always somebody, right? So Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. He still didn't get it. You know how patient Jesus must have been putting up with the 12 disciples with different personalities, with different faith levels. Some of them didn't have anything, even though they were hanging out with Jesus Christ everywhere he went. Raising the dead, healing the lepers, opening the eyes of the blind. Raising the man who was laying down by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. God did so many miracles. But look at this man, Thomas, nicknamed the twin. What did he say? Come, let's go and let's die with him too. As if he's going to die with him. Even at this point, this man did not have faith. Jesus already knew. He didn't say anything. Because he already said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to do the miracle and you'll believe. I want you to believe. So remember, every miracle God does in our life is with a purpose. Jesus Christ is very intentional when he does a miracle in your life and in my life. You know what the net result he's looking for is? For you and I to believe in him. Not because if we don't believe in him, his worth is going to get less, no. It's not that if we don't believe in him, that his power is going to be diminished. No. If you and I don't believe in him, he's still God. His power is still the same. He has a host of angels and hosts of heaven, all of heavens, worshiping him. But he wants you and I to believe in him so that we can become everything that God wants us to be. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that God exists, number one. Number two, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That means if you go to Jesus every day and say, Lord Jesus, this is my trouble. This is what is happening to me. Lord, will you hear me? Lord, will you answer me? Lord, will you fix this problem? You don't have to go and say a huge long prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God. We need to have that relationship with God. Just come and show God our life situation. Just talk to him. Just simply talk to him. That's what I used to do when I was in high school, middle school, college. Whatever I was facing, I used to come to the room and talk to Jesus. Even if I got a trophy, I'd come and say, I'd run to the room, close the door and say, Jesus, look what you gave me. 
Simple faith. Simply talk to Jesus. Unless you know that he is there, why will you go and do something like that, right? Make yourself look crazy. We're not crazy when we talk to Jesus Christ because he is alive. When we talk to him, he is right there. I challenge you. The more you talk to him, you're going to start hearing his voice. Unless I talk to him, I'm never going to know who he is. This man, though he was with Jesus Christ, called a disciple of Jesus Christ, he did not really know Jesus Christ. He was with him. He was going everywhere he was going. He was seeing all the miracles. But he didn't have the faith to understand what Jesus said. That's why he said something totally strange. He didn't even realize that he made a fool out of himself saying something like that. But you know what? Our God never puts a person down. Human beings do that, right? Very often they do that. They would like to make us feel how dumb we are. Human beings would like to put another person down just to make themselves look good. That is an abomination before God. God never does that. No matter how dumb we may appear because of just blurting things out, God still comes and he still says, I'm here to explain the situation to you, my daughter. I'm here to make you understand, my son, that is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how difficult it may appear for us to understand, all we need to do is go to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't understand this. Lord, I don't understand a thing about this. Can you show me what it is, Lord? We need to learn to wait. Now, Jesus goes here. Let's go to verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss, his two sisters, Martha and Mary. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. I want to stop here and make you look at these two verses over here. There's something substantial going on here which you and I often do in our lives. We say, Lord, I believe, right? Lord, I believe that even now you can do something. But when Jesus said, I'm going to do something right now, what was the next statement that comes out of the mouth? Oh, Lord, not now. I know that you will raise him up at the last day. Contradicting our own statement here. We say we believe, but next moment we don't believe. May God help us. May God help us to truly have the faith that Jesus had to truly know who Jesus Christ is, to say, Lord, I know that you will raise him up from the dead. Yes, Lord, do it. I'm here. That's the kind of faith that God was talking about when he talked about, if you believe and say to a mountain, right? Many times we try to say, oh, I believe. And you want to say something for something to happen. But before you could even finish that sentence, unbelief sets in your heart. How can you expect something to happen then? cannot happen. But God says, know who God is. If you have the knowledge who God is, like just like I said, say the mortgage company, Wells Fargo or some mortgage company said, before 17th, you postmark your mail and you send it to us. We're going to reduce your mortgage from maybe 2,500 to 1,500. What do we do we have faith in Wells Fargo, don't we? We do. That's why what we do, hastily we go. Whatever we need to do, we take off from work, whatever. We do not want to miss that deadline because we have faith in Wells Fargo. Why? Because we know Wells Fargo is a bank. We know Wells Fargo when it says it will do it. We know that if they don't do it, they'll be in trouble because we have in paper, in writing. If they promise something and they will do it. How much more you and I need to believe in God, almighty God, who has given us in writing in his holy word that I will never leave you nor forsake you. How much more do you and I need to believe 
We can believe in Wells Fargo. We can believe in other companies. We can believe even, like I said, McDonald's. We fail to believe in the Almighty God. Nobody is going to tell McDonald's, go to McDonald's and say, hey, give me two burgers. And while they take the order, hey, excuse me, are you really going to give me the burgers? You don't look like you're going to give me the burgers. And I don't think you're going to, you know what they'll say? If you don't believe, please go. I need the next customer to serve. Nobody does that. You believe in the person who's taking the order, don't you? I believe, right, when I place the order. We don't go to the ATM machine and punch in the numbers and ramble, staying there. I don't think it's going to give me that $20. What kind of number? How if I touch this touch screen? How is this going to happen? No, because you believe in that ATM machine. How much more in the Almighty God? ATM machine is just a machine. McDonald's is just a building. People are just people who will live today and die tomorrow. They are just doing their job. But your Father in heaven is not just doing his job. He cares about you and cares about me. When we ask him for something, know for sure that it is done. That's what Jesus said. When you ask me for something, Jesus said, it is done by my Father in heaven. How much more you and I need to believe him. More than the ATM machine. More than McDonald's. More than Wells Fargo. More than a piece of paper that comes in the mail. We put our trust in that. Like I said a few weeks ago, it's not that you and I don't have faith. It's where we place our faith on. Where is it? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Is your faith on what you see or is your faith on what you don't see? Where do you put your faith on? The kingdom of God operates by faith. The supernatural world operates by faith. It operates by faith because your father says that he will do it. If he said he will give it, he will give it. What do we do when somebody says, oh, I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock, I'll give it to you, right? Say so you call somebody, you call a friend and say, hey, I need $300 by tomorrow. Can you please give it? And your friend says, okay, tomorrow, 3 p.m., I'll give you $300. What will you say? You're going to say, thank you, right? You didn't get the $300 yet. You say, thank you, thank you so much. You don't even know what it means to me. You'll say all kinds of things just because the person said, I'll give you $300. Now, if the person locks the door and disappears and goes somewhere tomorrow at 3 o'clock, that's a whole different story. It's just a human being. We put our trust in that human being, even before we get something. But my God says in his word that he is not a man that he should lie. Human beings make promise a thousand times and they'll break it a thousand hundred times. But God never breaks the promise. When he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, we shouldn't be living like beggars going and asking God, Lord, give me $10, $10, $10. $10 is enough, Lord, not more than $10. Lord, I'm not asking any more than $10, Lord. Go tell God what you need. Go tell God what you need. Lord, this is what I need. Tell him what you need. God says, I will give you much more than you ask or imagine. God did something supernatural here in the life of Lazarus. I'm not going to read all the verses here, even though we can. I strongly encourage you to go home and read this passage. But I want to conclude in a few minutes to bring your attention to what really happened over here. Now over here, Martha says, Lord, I know that you can heal. I know you can do something right now, right here. But she says, oh, when Jesus said, I'm going to do it, I think it's going to happen at the last day, Lord. If you can't believe that it's going to happen now, how will you even believe that it's going to happen the last day, right? Last day you're going to stand and you say, I don't think it's going to happen, Lord. Jesus says, if you cannot love a person that you can see, how can you love a God that you cannot see? If you can't believe for the now, for the present, how can you believe God for eternity? If you can't believe God that he can do something for you now, do you really believe that he will take you to heaven? If you can't believe Jesus Christ that he can put food on your table, he can put good food on your table, how can you believe that Jesus Christ can give you heaven? We can say it, but do we really believe it? Our faith is in who 
who God is right now, right here. Every day when we believe Jesus, every day when we hold the hand of Jesus and walk with him, our faith will get stronger and stronger and stronger. Apart from Jesus Christ, you and I cannot do anything. With him, we can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No matter how difficult your circumstance may look, no matter how impossible your circumstance may look, I'd say the more difficult it is, we need to rejoice even more because something good is going to come out of that. God is going to be glorified through that. So I'm going to finish. Let's go to verse 26. Let's see how Jesus replied to her. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Jesus didn't rebuke her. Jesus didn't scold her. Jesus didn't say, oh, Martha, how many times did I come to your house? How many times did I stay at your house? How many people did I heal you saw before? You can't believe Martha. You're not getting anything from me. He didn't say that. He's talking to her again. He's saying, oh, Martha, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Jesus is talking about the soul here. And he's saying, you know what? He's not going to die. Your brother will live. And let's see what she says. Yes, Lord, she told him. I always, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So verse 29 says, and 30 says, Mary got up and she ran to see Jesus. And 31 says, everybody went to see what was happening with Mary. They thought she just lost it because of sorrow. And then let's go to verse 32. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's saying something expression of faith saying lord if you would have been here you heal so many sick people lord but look what happened to my brother you were not here lord you left him to die lord you were not here if you would have been here my brother would not have died because you had the power to heal her faith was up to receiving the healing as long as there was breath in the body not after he died Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him as he was deeply troubled. Now this anger was not towards Martha and Mary. His anger was not towards the people. His anger was towards death. He said this death has caused heartbreak to Mary, heartbreak to Martha, heartbreak to all of these people. Why did death come? Death came because of sin to the world. He was angry at death. And what did Jesus do after that? 34, he said, where have you put him, he said. He was angry at death. Now he wanted to take power over death. He looked at the people and said, where did you put him? Show me. Verse 35. The moment they all said, Lord, come and see. Come and see the tomb, Lord. Come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus was moved with compassion. He saw the people crying. He got angry at death. And he cried, looking at the tears of the people. Remember that. God's heart breaks when your heart breaks. God weeps when we weep. When we cry at the feet of Jesus, everything is documented by him. He says, oh, injustice has been done to you? Oh, the enemy did this? He robbed this from you? God gets angry at the devil, not at you. He gets mad at the devil and he says, I am going to help you right now. When you go to God, you're going to best friend. When you go to God, you're going to your heavenly father. When you go to God, you're going to the source of everything. He's the only one who can take vengeance on your enemies. He's the only one who can take vengeance on death. He's the only one who can take vengeance on sickness. He's the only one who can take vengeance on demonic powers. You and I can't. When we take our problems to the Lord Jesus Christ, know for sure he will get angry at the source of your problem. And he will be moved with compassion. He will weep 
with you. Verse 36. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. See how much he loved him. I want you to look at this verse. Look at your own life. See how much he loves you. See how much Jesus loves you. In the midst of your problems, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of the unknown, when you are scared, when you don't know what your future holds for you. Remember how much Jesus loves you. The people around them were able to see, look how much Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus loves you more than you know. Jesus loves you more than you know. I'm going to conclude with what Jesus did here. Verse 37. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. 39. He's hearing all these words of unbelief while he's walking. He said, oh, Jesus, by the way, he opened the eyes of the blind over there. He could have healed this man. Couldn't he have healed this man? Why did he come so late? Remember, people will talk as long as they can talk. No talk of any human being should discourage you in any way. Our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus Christ because he alone can raise the dead. He alone can resurrect our dead circumstance. He alone can breathe life into our circumstance. If we hear what he said, what she said, what they said, what their grandma said, what their grandpa said, what, you know, my friend said or my enemy said, you're going to drown in the words of the people. You need to open your eyes to God and close your eyes to all that people say. You're not living for somebody else. God didn't create you to live for somebody else. God didn't create you to look for approval from somebody else. God created you and I to enjoy everything God has given to us to the maximum by walking with him, by talking to him. He brings everything that we need right before us. And Jesus Christ was walking towards the tomb. He didn't pay attention to any of the words that any of the people said. No negative words penetrated through the ears of Jesus. He was a strong person. May God help you and I to be like that. Be strong inside. Have that internal strength in our heart. Not to get discouraged and downhearted. The moment we hear somebody saying something, don't let another human being run your life. Don't let Satan, run your life. Let God and his word alone run your life. Jesus was so strong. He just kept walking and walking. He said, I'm not paying attention to this. I'm not paying attention to that. I'm going because I have a mission to fulfill. Let's see what he says over here. Verse 39. It's a beautiful, powerful verse. He says, roll the stone aside. Roll the stone aside. That which was blocking first. The miracle to happen. That which was preventing, right? Lazarus from coming out. He says, roll the stone away. Because God is about to do something in the life of Lazarus. God is speaking to you today. God is about to do something in your life. Roll your stone away. That is your job. God's, not, God's job is to bring Lazarus out. What we cannot do, God is there to do. The healing that needs to happen, you and I cannot do, God is there to do. But our step that we need to take to roll the stone away in our life, remove the unbelief out of our life, the action that shows faith needs to happen first before God can do anything in our life. Before God could bring Lazarus out, what did God say for people to do? Roll the stone away. Before God can resurrect your son, before God can resurrect your daughter, before God can resurrect your life, before God can bring a miracle in my life, in my family, my job is to do what God has told me to do, is to roll the stone away. Rolling the stone away is an expression of faith. God could have done that. Jesus could have just stood there and he could have said, stone roll away and it would have rolled by itself. Where's your part in receiving your miracle then? 
Where is my part in receiving my miracle then? God wants you and I to be partakers of what God is doing. When God does something, he wants you and I to be partakers of what he is doing. He said, move the stone away, roll the stone away. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. She was the one who expressed faith, right? To say, Lord, I believe that you can do it. And look at her action. It's so important that our actions must match our words. Martha, who said, Lord, I believe, and look what she's doing over here. She's saying, Lord, it has been four days. My brother has been dead, and it's been four days since he's been in that tomb. The smell will be terrible, Lord. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? I want to stop here. We're going to end this message here. Didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God if you would believe? I'll tell you what happened. Jesus went. Jesus rose, Lazarus, from the grave. Today, what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and to me. Didn't I tell you I'm going to do something in your life? Didn't I tell you I'm going to raise the dead in your life? Didn't I tell you I'm going to resurrect what is dead in your life? Didn't I tell you what looks empty? I'm going to fill that with my glory. Didn't I promise you all the promises? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. You're not believing in a magician. You're not believing in some old folktale but you are believing in the words of the Almighty God. Let me tell you this. There's power in the word of the Almighty God. There's power in the words of the Almighty God. There's power in the words of the Almighty God. If he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to raise him up, I'm going to wake him up, that should be enough for you and for me. If he says, roll the stone, then my job and your job is to roll the stone, not stand there and try to teach God. Tell him, oh Lord, this is going to sting us if he doesn't know. Many times we try to play counselors to God. We try to stand there and explain God how impossible our circumstances. We stand before our grave, before our tomb. And we stand there before our problem and we try to explain to God, Lord, this is why it's so impossible. I don't think you can do a thing about it. Remember, you are just a man. Just a woman. We are just flesh and bones. As long as his heart is beating, that's how long we can live. He's the one who keeps our heart beating. We dare not stand before God when he's about to do something big, we dare not stand before God and say, oh, Lord, by the way, I don't think you can do it, Lord, because I think that this is too big. God will look at you and God will say, who are you to think that this is too big? Who are you? You think too high of yourself, higher than God, to come and explain to God why this is impossible? If he says it, I believe it. If God says it, I believe it. If God says it, I believe it. Shall we close our eyes and stand up together? Thank you, Jesus. Nothing is difficult for the Almighty God. The Lord God of heaven and earth, who made the skies, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain, who makes the impossible possible. Death couldn't stand before him. He is the king of glory, the one who has compassion over us. Hallelujah. The one who breathes life into us. Hallelujah. The one who says, I can make all things new. I can heal your body, heal your mind, heal your soul. That my word is enough, more than enough to penetrate into every single cell, every single organ. Hallelujah. And I'm the Lord God who makes all things new. When Jesus comes and stands next to you and he says, do you believe this? And he calls out your name and he says, do you believe I'm able to turn your circumstance around? Do you believe this? I'm able to resurrect this deadness. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? God is asking you face to face today. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? How many of us can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I can. Lord, I know you will. And I'm going to be the one to roll my stone away. I'm going to roll the unbelief away. 
Put trash in the trash can. Throw unbelief in the trash can today. Where it belongs, it does not belong in the heart of a believer. We cannot call ourselves believers. We cannot call ourselves believers if we don't believe. It's a contradiction. God, help us to be believers, Lord. Help us to truly believe everything, every word that you have said, O oh Lord. You're able to resurrect our dead circumstance. You're able to resurrect everything pertaining to our lives, everything pertaining to our lives. Hallelujah. Every area will blossom, says the Lord Most High, as God spoke to us last week. When that river comes into that Dead Sea, every area of the Dead Sea will blossom. All of a sudden, trees grow by the river, bearing fruit. A lot of fish come, fishermen come there. What looked barren and empty, all of a sudden, started to blossom. People started coming there. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today. Do you believe this? Do you believe that I am able to resurrect your life? Do you believe I am able to make all things new? Do you believe that I'm able to heal your mind, soul, and your body? Do you believe that I'm able to provide you with a bright future? Do you believe I'm able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or imagine? Do you believe that I am able to turn your sorrow into joy? Do you believe that I'm able to turn your night today? Do you believe that I'm able to make all things brand new? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your heavenly Father. Father, we come before your throne of grace with the blood of Jesus in our hands. We ask you, heavenly Father, that you'll touch your people right now. In the name of Jesus, I praise your servant, O oh Lord. I ask you that you'll touch your people right now. Wherever they are, I ask you, Holy Spirit, touch them right now. Holy Spirit, touch us right now in Jesus' name. From the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, I pray, touch us right now in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for your touch, your brand new touch, your powerful touch, in the name of Jesus, from your nail pierced hands, O oh Lord, be granted right now at this hour in Jesus' name. And I pray. Whatever is afflicting our bodies, whatever is plaguing our minds, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command it to be removed right now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every spirit of death, every smell of death, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as a servant of the Most High God, I command it to leave God's people right now, once and for all, never to come back again, in the name of Jesus, out right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. May every single cell in every one of our bodies live, live, live in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Live to the glory of God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your goodness, O oh Lord. Help us to hold on to your word. Help us, Lord, to thrive by your word. Help us, Lord, to overcome by your word. Help us, Lord, to grow by your word. Help us to live by your word. Help us live a joyful Christian life that you have meant for us to have. Heavenly Father, to abound in grace and peace through knowing the power of the Almighty God. Help us to walk with you every single day. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing this song. I'm sure and declare your name everywhere. For this love.